Mr. Moore is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate you holding this hearing today. It's very important. It's something that's very, uh, very much of interest to my home state uh, on these issues, and I'm pleased to have the Utah State's Treasurer, Mr. Marlo Oaks, here um, testifying to, before our committee today. More importantly, uh, your wife Elaine is also in attendance, which always helps your message land better, and we appreciate you making the trip. So. Uh, I'd like to submit for the record an April 2022 letter signed by Utah's entire federal delegation and its statewide elected leaders opposing the use of so-called ESG credit indicators that could adversely affect Utah's credit rating based on factors other than Utah's ability to repay debt. So ordered, thank you. No objections, you. so ordered, Mr. Moore. Treasurer Oaks, considering uh, this will come as no surprise to my colleagues, I'm gonna talk about Utah's strengths and how good we are in so many different facets. Uh, but considering Utah's strong economic performance and job creation, could you describe how ESG investment frameworks might negatively impact the entrepreneurial ecosystem, particularly for startups and small businesses that are actually thriving in our state? Yes, thank you for that question. So whereas Adam Smith, the 18th century moral philosopher, he spoke of an invisible hand as the driving force behind capital allocation, each citizen pursuing their own desires and interests, ESG represents an invisible fist of economic coercion. So I've spoken with executives of startups and small companies in Utah who have said that venture capital firms and large clients have asked them to complete long ESG questionnaires, including questions such as whether or not 60% or more of their board and staff are trans, LGBTQ+, or women. If certain demographic ratios are not met, the surveys then ask whether there are policies in place to terminate employees who are not in the protected classes until at least 50% of employees are in those classes within six months. Other questions ask about company benefit policies, Efforts to monitor electricity usage monthly, assurance that renewable electric sources are used at an increasing amount each month, and policies to monitor airline travel to ensure employees are flying on aircraft with technology that is reducing the carbon footprint. Executives have expressed concerns about not having the resources to monitor these activities and wasting precious capital needed to grow the company for these kinds of activities. In some cases, small, smaller companies are forced to comply or lose business with larger companies. Quite simply, ESG represents economic coercion that harms businesses, individuals, investors, and markets. It's not good for anyone. Uh, Mr. Oaks, you and I, I would say we both understand the business community a little bit. I've, we've, we've both been in the private sector uh, with a lot of business leaders, uh, Utah leaders in general. Simple question, would you say that they need ESG to contribute to their community, to engage in social impact projects, to, to, to care for the, less, the most vulnerable? Do you, do you, would you say that Utah needs that? I, I would say that people in general, particularly in Utah, are concerned about other citizens and, and we really go out of our way to serve other people in our state and help other people and there's no need to force that on businesses that they have a they have a desire to help out, um, and, and it, it, you generally get better outcomes. As we see with the state of Utah, we have the highest volunteer uh, rate in, in the country, and, and it's done uh, because people want to, not because they're forced to. Yeah, I'm sure everybody here has read, I, I was part of publishing something called The Giving State in my previous career. That's a joke, I know you haven't read it. <laughs> but it highlights that Utah has really focused on philanthropic causes. Most volunteer time, most volunteer dollars in per capita. It is a state that understands it, and it is led by primarily the private sector. Yeah. And the thing that I hear most from folks is, don't, don't, don't force us into these, into these particular outcomes. We're already doing the good work. Let us thrive, let us, let, let us be able to continue to make these decisions. Um, when it comes down to, and this is something you communicate really well, the, just highlight for me with the last 20 seconds, any specific p potential risks of ESG-driven investment strategies that prioritize political agendas over shareholder value. Yeah, I, I think, you know, as, been, as, as has been stated, I think 
Companies need to focus on their business and providing the best good and service in the marketplace at the most competitive price. That is the benefit to society. That's, that leads to better uh, uh, economic outcomes. It leads to a, a growth in, in uh, living standards. And, and that's the value that business brings to uh, the world and the community. And, and the innovation that comes from our free market system is what allows us to address things like climate change and that's that's what we need. We need to have our free market system uh, independent of political agendas that are being pushed. And that's always something I've appreciated with your message. You talk about these things are good causes. Let's go about it the right way, and let's go about it so people can make the freedom, have the freedom to choose how they want to address it. So thank you, and I yield back.